Hello and a very warm welcome to this year's Children's Christmas Lecture. So my name is Amanda and I'm from the student recruitment team and I'll be hosting the session tonight. It's great to have so many of you joining us and we'll soon be embarking on a very exciting journey into space. And uh, I didn't realise you could actually travel to space in uh, a Santa hat, but that is exactly what I'll be doing this evening and I hope you'll join me too. So this, this year's lecture will be given by our very own Professor Sanjeev Gupta, and he'll be talking about the early adventures of the Perseverance rover since it landed on Mars earlier this year. If you attended the lecture last year, you would have heard Sanjeev talk about the launch of the rover into space, but we're pleased to say that it safely landed on Mars earlier this year uh, in February, and he'll be talking about all the, all the adventures that it's been up to and its early discoveries. It'd be great if you could let us know that you're here by asking as many questions as possible and popping that in the chat. And if you see a question that you like, please like it with the like function and we'll pick out the most popular questions and we'll definitely get through those before the end of the evening, although we will endeavour to answer as many as we possibly can. The last thing for me to say is that the, the session tonight will be recorded, so if you miss anything, uh, it, it will be made available to you shortly after the lecture, so don't worry, uh, you can watch it again at your leisure. So I think all that's left for me to do is hand over to Sanjeev. Thanks, Amanda. So it's wonderful to join you here. Um, thank you all for joining today on this uh, not so cold December evening. Um, it's much colder on Mars and I'm going to show you some temperatures on Mars in a bit. So what I want to tell you about is what the Perseverance rover is doing on Mars in the last 10 months. We've been on Mars for 10 months and I'm representing the science team for Perseverance and Perseverance is a science team of something like 400 scientists and probably two or three hundred engineers all working together around the world to operate this robot. So it's not that the old robot operates by itself, it requires a lot of help and the team members are spread across the world. Actually almost 40 percent of the team members are actually international and the rest are from the US because it's a NASA mission. And personally, I, as a scientist, I'm a geologist, I'm an earth scientist. So what I do is I study the surface of the earth and I also look at rocks on the earth to try and reconstruct what the past earth was like. So what was the ancient surface of the earth like and what processes operate on, operated on earth in its ancient past. And now we're beginning that journey to be able to do exactly that same sort of science on Mars. And what, what I find wonderful about what I do is that it integrates all the different sciences. So I work with physicists and engineers who build the instruments and the robots. Um, I work with chemists who do the chemical analysis, the geochemical analysis on the Martian rocks with the instruments that we have. And obviously I work with biologists or what we call astrobiologists, that's people, experts who are interested in finding life on Mars. Ultimately, you know, these missions are very expensive. Perseverance probably cost $2.8 billion. Um, and the goal of the mission is to see if we're alone in the universe. You know, did life arise on Mars? And what we're, we're not looking for present day life, we're looking for ancient life. But also equally importantly, Mars preserves a record of early, early history of planets, rocky planets that we call them like Earth. And we don't have that record on Earth. It's been erased by plate tectonics and deformation. And so Mars is the, one of the best places to go to to look at the earliest history of the rocky planets. And that's one of the reasons to go there and understand it. OK, so modern Mars on the left hand side is a cold, very cold, arid, dusty, dry, inhospitable place that I certainly wouldn't want to live on it. You know, you can see that red, reddish coloured thing. Very, very beautiful landscapes, a very, very harsh place to live. But Mars, 3.8 to 3.6 billion years ago, seems to have been much warmer and wetter with a climate maybe similar to Earth, not exactly the same, but maybe similar to Earth. And we see evidence from orbital observations. So we have, have uh, numerous satellites going around Mars, taking pictures of the surface of Mars. And we see evidence for rivers and lakes. And even some people claim an ocean in the northern part of Mars that you can see here. But also, um, 
we can see evidence for hydrated minerals, so minerals with lots of water attached to them, and that suggests that there was water-rock interaction. So there's plentiful evidence of past action of water on the surface of Mars, but we just don't know how much and for how, how long it lasted. And that's obviously really important for habitability. Was Mars habitable in the past? And it's very difficult to determine this from orbiters, and so we need to land on the surface of Mars. So actually what's amazing is, and this is one of the best head, newspaper headlines I've ever seen in my life, this is actually from the New York Times, you know, pretty major newspaper in 1911, where they reported the findings of um, Percy, Percival Lowell, who was a very famous American astronomer who mapped what were called the canals on the surface of Mars. And here he documents how um, the Martians have built two immense canals. So about a hundred years ago, um, people actually thought there was a civilization living on Mars. That was a dying civilization because they were running out of water. Well, actually, by the 20, 1930s, that was proven to be wrong. And this was actually an optical illusion. So there's a long history of exploration of Mars from orbiters and landers. I'm really going to talk only about rovers and mainly perseverance, but I did want to mentioned Curiosity, Curiosity, and I've been working on Curiosity since 2012, Curiosity landed on Mars in 2012, and everybody's forgotten Curiosity because there's a new kid on the block, but Curiosity is still on Mars. In fact, we have three rovers on Mars that are active, Curiosity, Perseverance, and the Chinese rover Zurong, that's the latest rover, but Curiosity has been there since 2012 and is doing amazing science. So this is a, a picture Curiosity took of itself a narcissistic rover, um, very, very recently in this amazing, beautiful terrain. And actually, Curiosity is now, today, nestled just somewhere over here, probably. We're doing a very interesting experiment um, at the moment. And the rocks are really amazing here, so it's not that the science that Curiosity is doing is boring. In fact, let's have a look at this picture. Let's hope it comes up. Try again. Oops. Can you see that? Oh, dear me. Hold on a second. I just have to come out of this since my. Ah, there we are. Bear with me. I'm going to take this. I'm just going to try and get rid of this somehow. There we go. And we will share the screen again. You can't have a talk without technical problems. There we go. And so this is a beautiful picture recently taken of this mountain. It looks all red and barren, and it is red and barren, but actually the rocks at the base over here were formed in a watery environment in ancient lakes. And we actually see a transition from lake sediments to sediments, these rocks over here, which were deposited in an ancient desert environment. So Mars actually dried out in this picture. And that's a major environmental transition. And, and we don't know whether it's local to where Curiosity is, Gale Crater, or whether it's a more global phenomenon. OK, turning to Perseverance. So this is Perseverance. It's a cartoon of Perseverance. And you can see all the instruments on Perseverance. Now, Perseverance has a different set of instruments. Some of the instruments are similar to Curiosity, but and the rover is actually kind of a carbon copy of uh, Curiosity, but there's many new instruments because it's doing very, very different things. Let me just point out some of the instruments. So we've got the cameras over here, MarsCam Z, which is the geological cameras. I'm not on the MarsCam Z team. We've got a laser here called SuperCam that does semi-quantitative uh, geochemistry looks for organics and takes amazing long distance pictures. We've got a weather station. We've got radar that peers under the surface of Mars. That's a first for Mars. We've got MOXIE, which is an instrument that's preparing for humans to go to Mars. And that actually is producing oxygen from Martian carbon dioxide. It's been very successful. And obviously astronauts that go to Mars, and I'm sure astronauts will go to Mars, maybe in the 2040s or 2050s, They'll need oxygen to breathe, and so this is a demonstrator to see whether we can create oxygen from the carbon dioxide that is in the Martian atmosphere. And then we have the arm, which is very special. It has two instruments, geochemistry instruments, to look at the chemical composition, Sherlock and Pixel, 
and also has a whole drilling assembly on, on the end of the arm, which is very, very special. And here is a selfie, so not just curiosity taking selfies, but um, um, Perseverance also takes selfies. And the reason it can take selfies is that at the end of the arm, we have a camera called Watson. And Watson uh, is actually a camera to look very closely at pictures of the rocks. I'm going to show you some of those. But what, what it can do is it can turn the camera around on itself and take a series of pictures to produce this beautiful mosaic. And I, I love these pictures because you get a sense of this robot on Mars and a sense of this is something that humans created and sent to a, another planet. Um, and, and so it's just an extraordinary image. OK, what are we doing? What are the mission objectives? So firstly, we're trying to understand the possibilities for life on Mars. And, the, and we're not looking for present day life because that's very hard. We don't actually think that life exists on Mars at the present day. Um, so we're looking for ancient life and we're looking at for life in rocks that were as old as the rocks that we find on Earth where we have the early traces of life. So we have to look at the geology. So that's looking at the rocks and trying to describe the rocks and characterizing rocks and finding the right rocks that we think might think might have contain evidence for life. And then we have an astrobiology that's about life itself. So do we have um, evidence for biosignatures? By biosignatures, I mean features in the rocks or that might be suggestive of life, not not proving life, but might be suggestive of life. So that might be chemical traces of life or sometimes actually what we see on Earth is that early creatures uh, created mats. I'll show you an example or traces. Obviously, you know, we'd love to find dinosaur bones. You know, that would be great, wouldn't it? You know, fantastic. I'd be just jumping all over the place. If I'm dinosaur. Of course, life may have evolved in a very different pattern, so it's very unlikely to find dinosaur bones. Um, but, uh, you know, what we might find, I'll show you a picture of what we might find. Then the most important goal of this mission, this what is what makes it different from all other missions, is that scientists like myself, geologists, would actually like the samples back on Earth. It's really difficult to analyze the rocks of Mars with instruments on the robots. Um, we can send quite complex instruments to Mars, but actually what we can do in Earth laboratories is just astonishing. And we can really examine the rocks in great detail with a huge arrays of laboratory instruments. And so our objective is, and you know, we collected samples from the moon, brought them back to Earth. We collected a lot of samples and we're still making amazing discoveries. There was a recent paper which completely changed the timing of when volc volcanic activity occurred on Mars because scientists invented new techniques. So it's all about inventing new techniques. So we want, we're going to cache, we're going to collect samples, we're going to leave them on the surface of Mars. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And then we're also preparing for humans to go to Mars, and that's that MOXIE in, instrument I talked about making oxygen, but also we're measuring the weather uh, on Mars and the dust, etc. OK, these are some of the earliest forms of life on Earth. About three and a half billion years ago, these come from the Pilbara area of Australia. And what you can see is these dome shaped features and these we call these microbial mats and these features are called stromatolites. And what's happened here is that we've had microbes leaving sticky layers on the sea floor and sediment has got trapped on those sticky layers and we've built up these domes. This is potentially something we might expect microbial life on Mars. That's the sort of life we might expect. And so the lake floors of Mars might have been sticky and trapped sediments. And so macroscopic large scale signatures. This is what we might expect, but even that is unlikely. I think the most likely is chemical signatures or looking for organic compounds. OK, and we're certainly not going to find early humanoids. This is a fantastic image. Somebody found this in a this is a bit of street art in Lyon in France that one of my colleagues found wandering around the city. So isn't that fantastic? Yeah, curiosity has to be careful, but it does have a laser to, you know, fight off any spears. OK, I'm not going to talk in detail about the instruments, but perhaps this is the most important thing. This is the arm assembly at the, at the this is the drilling assembly at the end of the arm. It's just an amazingly complex bit of kit and um, these are the stabilizers. So the, the arm assembly at the end of the arm is put on a rock and these are used to stabilize and the drill bit comes out of here basically. And these are all the different bits. So 
These are the drill bits, coring bits to core, to collect the samples. And these two over here are called abrading bits, and that's where we abrade the rock surface to look at a fresh rock surface. <coughs> and we're going to collect, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we're going to collect 38 tubes of rock and regolith in these sample tubes. And the sample tubes only hold about um, can hold about 10 cubic centimeters of material, a tiny amount of material in these titanium tubes. And then we have five witness tubes, and those are empty tubes basically to make sure that there's no contamination. So we don't put anything in those. So total 43 sample tubes. These are going to be the most expensive rock samples ever collected. OK, and as we collect the samples, we actually store them. This is the rover's rucksack, if you like, a very complex rucksack. And these are the sample tubes. This is where we store them. And this is a sample handling arm, which basically collects the tube, puts it in the coring bit. Then we collect, put the core into the sample tube. And then we insert it into this sample handling facility, the ACA, using this arm. And that's where we store them. So, you know, amazing contraption. It is a contraption. Um, and is working perfectly fine. It's just astonishing. So at the moment, this contains four rock samples, one witness tube and one atmospheric sample. So, you know, we're filling it up slowly. And in the next week, we're actually going to be collecting two more rock samples. So it's pretty exciting. And towards the end of the week, maybe Friday or Saturday, we'll be coring one more rock sample. OK, so where did Perseverance go? So um, this is a topographic map of Mars. So the colors are elevation or heights. They don't represent, so the blues don't represent water. The blues are low lying areas of Mars and the yellows and reds and the whites are high topography. So these are the big volcanoes on Mars. This is Olympus Mons, which is the tallest volcano in the solar system. And you can see that this orange terrain of yellow terrain is pockmarked with craters. This is really old terrain. This is about 3.5 to 3.7 billion years old and we want rocks in this sort of terrain because they're some of the oldest rocks on Mars. We can see the evidence for giant impacts over here and over here and over here. This is the Isidus impact basin and Perseverance landed here um, and Curiosity landed here, just over here. So those of you who've seen the film The Martian, which is a pretty good film actually, it's scientifically pretty accurate, well, Matt Damon, the actor in that movie, he landed there. Um, who knows, he may still be there. Maybe we've not really collected him digging potatoes. All right, so this is Perseverance's field site. This is the Isidus impact base, and this is 3.9 billion years old. And this is Jezero Crater over here. The exciting thing about this crater is this crater is about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. So it's going to be the oldest place that uh, um, we've been to on Mars, but outside the crater we have really old rocks, older than rocks we have on Earth basically, that are undeformed. And what we're going to do is the first part of the mission is going to be within the crater, and then we're going to drive out of the crater and collect samples from these really old rocks. And that's going to be tremendously exciting because, you know, they're undeformed, there's no plate tectonics, so we're just going to get a sample of really early terrestrial planets that we just don't have on Earth. And so I'm really excited about that. But let's focus on Jezero Crater that's located there. And this is a topographic map of Jezero Crater. So this is the center of the crater over here. It's about 45 kilometers in diameter. And the reason this was chosen is that from orbit, we knew that this crater once held water. It had been a lake. And the reason we know this is that there's a valley entering the crater. This is a river valley entering the crater, but we also have a river valley exiting the crater. And what happened is that water came into the crater, filled it up, and at some point the eastern rim of the crater breached and water flooded out. So we know it must have been filled with water. And the key thing that we were excited about was at the where the inlet valley, river valley, enters the crater, we have a mound of sediment. And this is interpreted as a delta. A delta is where a river feeds into a standing body of water. They're abundant on Earth. In fact, most of the Earth's population lives on big deltas like the Bengal Delta and the Nile Delta and the 
um, uh, Rhine Delta. Uh, so very environmentally significant places. And deltas are really great places to look for early life. And so astrobiologists love these areas. So we're interested in this delta. And the black circle shows you the ellipse, the landing ellipse where Perseverance landed. And we, can, we were able to map different units geological units. So what we want to do is to identify different types of rocks. And one of the reasons that Jezero Crater was actually chosen was they had a wide diversity of rocks. So this, these are the crater floor rocks, which had a diverse opinions on what formed those. We have the delta rocks over here. And then these purple rocks here, these are really interesting because they, we call them the marginal deposits, and they contain uh, signatures from orbit of carbonate minerals. And carbonates are really good in particular situations of preserving life. So we're very, very excited about that. Then we've got the crater rim formed when we had the Jezero impact. And then outside, we've got the rocks that we want to look at when we drive out of the crater. So we're going to either drive, we're going to drive across the delta, through this valley and out, or maybe just over the crater rim. And these are really these ancient rocks that lie outside the crater. And at the moment, we're sitting here, over here, looking at the crater floor rocks. So many of you will know about the landing. It takes seven minutes to land on Mars from when entering the Martian atmosphere. And the key issue is, that because it takes seven minutes for a signal to reach Mars and 40 minutes backwards and forwards, once you start landing, there's nothing you can do. You can't send a, a correct signal or everything. So everything about landing has to be autonomous. The rover or the spacecraft has to do everything by itself. Now, engineers like to go to nice flat places where there's no obstacles, but geologists want to go to interesting places with lots of obstacles. And so what they did for this mission was to devise a completely new way of landing. Well, they used the same system, landing system as Curiosity, but it had special radars where it could steer itself through the atmosphere and land and avoid um, hazards, basically. What it was doing was taking pictures continuously as it was landing and comparing them to a base map and then seeing where they were relative to the hazard and then avoiding those and going sort of sideways, etc. So I love this picture because this is a picture taken by the, uh, a, a satellite going around Mars off another spacecraft landing. So you can see here, this is Perseverance with a huge parachute spotted by the MRO orbiter. And here is a beautiful, so they, they put, fitted the landing system with all these GoPro cameras. And you can see there's the parachute unfurling. So there's a nice uh, UK story to this parachute. The material for this parachute was actually made by a specialist firm in Devon who specialised in, you know, making parachutes for very specialist things. So that parachute, parachute was built in the US, but the material was actually sewn in uh, Devon, in Tiverton, in fact, if anyone comes from Tiverton. OK, so this is a picture of the heat shield coming off. And then it was landed like Curiosity on a series of three nylon tethers from this spacecraft over here. And again, they had some GoPro cameras attached to the landing vehicle. And you, so you can actually see the landing happening. It's not fake, it actually happened. And here we go. The next set of pictures show it landing on the surface of Jezero Crater. Here we go, spooled further and further down. And then we get this dust cloud. And just as soon as it touched the surface, firstly, they cut the cords. All the cords were cast, and then there were some retro rockets that propelled the landing craft sideways so it didn't actually crash into the rover because that wouldn't have been so good. All right, and we land in a place that we named the Octavia E. Butler landing site. And Octavia E. Butler was a very famous science fiction writer from the US. They actually grew up in Pasadena, which is where the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is, and she has these amazing books that are well worth uh, digging out, an amazing imagination. Um, and we've honoured her with the landing site. So this is a picture taken again by the high-rise camera on MRO. And this is, you can see the rover here sitting at the landing site on the surface of Mars. And what was beautiful about this landing site is we're at the edge of two very interesting geological units. We've got the rocks over here and we've got the rocks over here. I'm going to talk about these two separate geological units that have very, very different histories and very different chemistries. <coughs> so this is where we landed, looks bleak. 
and look, looking at these rocks. And these are the two different landing uh, geologies. So the rocks over here and the rocks over here with very different chemistries. And you can see, well, we caused some damage landing on Mars. My son always says you're causing environmental damage on Mars, which is true, uh, bad. As the small scale, so these are where the rockets have scoured out um, dust. They've removed dust, which is great for geologists because we, we can look at the rocks without this, uh, the dust. And then we've got the first initial wheel tracks over here. And we have these weird rocks, the paver stones we call them because they look like paving stones and we're still trying to understand those. <coughs> And we can look at the rocks at multiple scales with our cameras. So we can see zooming in right. And the final image is the Watson camera at about five centimeters away from the rock surface. In fact, we can get within two centimeters of rock surface. So imagine this is like putting your phone down on a rock two centimeters away from the rock surface, but we're 150 million miles away, which is just extraordinary. OK, and then we can see all these other types of rocks that we're trying to characterize and having lots of arguments and debates about what they are. The Martian rocks don't yield their secrets easily. OK, the other exciting spacecraft that we've had attached to the rover is a technology demonstrator, which is called the Ingenuity Helicopter. And this has been the first powered flight on another body away from Earth. And again, just an amazing engineering feat. Geologists love helicopters and drones because we can use them to scout out the terrain. And that's actually how we're using the helicopter at the moment, because obviously a, a robot can't go everywhere. And we get this bird's eye view of the landscape, which is fantastic. But it was just amazing to see this helicopter take off. So I'm gonna show you some movies. And so this is the first flight. You can see it just goes up. And remember, the Martian atmosphere is extremely thin. So to have spacecraft flight is just extraordinary. And what happens is we've got very, very large blades. I think they're almost a meter in diameter and they spin extremely fast to generate the lift required to lift the um, helicopter into the air. So we've just done, we're doing a whole series of flights. I'm going to show you flight number 13. We've got another flight uh, coming up later in the week. And this is flight number 13. Get the video going. So what's actually amazing about this video is not only the flight, but actually this video is actually taken by the Mascam Z camera. And what we have to do is we have to get the timing between two different clocks. So the, the rover has a clock and the helicopter has a clock to time it. And we have to synchronize the times and this is taken from about several hundred meters away because we can't be anywhere near the helicopter because we don't want it to crash into the rover. So can you imagine that we're pointing the camera and making sure that it's in the field of view of the camera, or the, the helicopter is in the field of the view of the camera to be able to image this and capture this in and, and be in focus basically. So just another engineering feat. So it's this combination of science and engineering, and it's just taking amazing images for us to actually explore the geology. Okay, so weather, we have a weather station, and you can see here that you wouldn't want to live on Mars, basically. It's pretty balmy here. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cold here. So the highs at the moment on December 12th were minus nine degrees centigrade, and the lows were minus 79 degrees centigrade. So I know that Elon Musk, wants to go on Mars to Mars. I'm not sure it's the most, it's not the best place for me to live and I'd actually happily send Elon Musk and somebody else to do that. I'm certain astronauts will go and we're generating important data for them to uh, to look at. Okay, and you can see our cameras record some atmospheric events. Here's a gust of Martian dust, which is cool. So we were able to do some science early on in the mission as something I was involved in. What we used, we used our cameras to actually look at the face of the delta. We were interested in the sediments that make up the delta over here. And we imaged the delta scarp over here. And this little remnant or little isolated uh, pile of rock called, that we called Kodiak. And we got amazing views of this. 
So this is just a movie, or this is just a huge mosaic we took um, um, with our full zoom cameras looking at that delta scarp and the rocks that we're actually going to drive over in detail and just just enjoy the scene the rocks at the back are the crater rim that we're going to climb over and it's just a beautiful landscape actually it would be amazing being an astronaut here and to witness this completely but we don't do too badly with these uh, images and then we would see amazing things and i won't talk in detail about these but what was amazing was that whilst we inferred with the orbital emission, so we, you know, we sort of guesstimated, if you like, that the, the that fan-shaped deposit was a delta, it was an absolute proof. This image was the proof because what you can see in this image is that this layer of rock, one layer here, another layer here, the two separate layers that are about 10 meters thick, has these beds. These are sediment beds that are inclined. You can see they're inclined to the left. These are the typical signature. And if you come and do geology at university, that's what you would learn about. They're the typical signature. You'd learn that in the first year, in fact, of deltas. What has happened is the delta, what happens is when a river enters a standing body of water, the river flow rapidly decelerates and you get rapid deposition and you build these layers. So what we had was proof that this was a delta from these sediments. You can see we've got some high res images over here from the SuperCam instrument. And so we know that was that this was a delta and that this was actually lake water filling the entire crater. So that was the final proof, really. So that's really great. We have a great environment to search for life. But then we found something surprising. Right at the top of the delta, we imaged these rocks in detail. And what we saw was something really surprising. What we saw was that it was full of boulders. This rock over here is over a meter and a half in diameter. So we see these really large clasps over here, and these require really high flow velocities. To lift up a boulder requires huge flow velocities. And so we interpret these rocks as being big flood deposits, not delta deposits, big flood deposits. So the environment has changed. We've had gone from sort of gradual river flow to build the delta to very rapid, high energy flows. You wouldn't want to be in this environment, basically. We don't know the reason for that. Maybe the climate changed or the hydrology changed, but there's something really exciting. And once we climb onto the delta, we'll be able to interrogate the rocks because this is obviously taken from two kilometers away. OK, since then, we've been exploring the rocks of the crater floor. And what we decided to do was to th this terrain over here is very difficult to cross. To go to the delta, we would drive completely to the west, but we can't cross this terrain. We actually have to go to the north, but we want to explore these rocks. So in the last you know, six months, we've actually been driving south. Five months, we've been driving south and we're actually sitting here at the moment. Today we're sitting here, but we've been exploring the rocks over here. I'm going to tell you about this journey. So the rocks are weird. We see all sorts of bizarre rock forms. We see all these rocks with holes in them. And we've been having a huge debate. Are these volcanic rocks spewed out of a big volcano on Mars? Unfortunately, we can't see the volcano. There's no volcano nearby, so it's really puzzling. Or are they sedimentary rocks formed by erosion and transport on the surface of Mars of particles under water conditions or wind conditions. And it's been really puzzling, but I think we're getting close to the answer now. So one of the first things we wanted to do was we wanted to, to collect a core sample in a, a benign terrain, a flatline terrain. So we chose this area over here that we named Rubion. Um, and this flatline rocks over here that the engineers deemed perfect for drilling, basically, to collect our first rock samples. And so this was the rock surface we collect, uh, we named Skilau. We, we are using French names at the moment for a particular reason. And you can see these flatline rocks that are easy to put our arm down on, basically. So we, we wanted a completely flat terrain so that it, the engineers didn't have any complexity in terms of topography on the rock surface where they could plan the movements of the arm. You could imagine moving the arm is very complex and remember we don't do anything real time because of the time delay so what we do is we send a whole series of commands and they happen the next day on mars so we have to get everything right all those computer sequences have to be correct 
The first thing we did, we actually abraded, we removed, you can see there's lots of dust on this surface. So we created a five centimeter pit on the rock surface that can peer into the minerals that you can see here. So here are the minerals, this fresh surface, and then we attacked it with all our chemistry instruments to look at the chemistry of these rocks with some very interesting results. And then what we did was we put our arm instruments down to look at the chemistry. And then we drilled. And this is our first drill attempt. Here's our drill core. And we thought, hurrah, we've collected a core and it's gone into the sample tube, into our sample handling facility. But, uh oh, when we looked in the drill core tube, there's no core. And we thought, oh, it's gone inside. There's no core. So it's it's gone deeper inside. You can see these are the stabilizers here. So this is the drill bit basically. And then inside the sample handling facility, the ACA, where all the tubes are stored, I showed you at the beginning, we have a camera that actually takes a picture of the rock before we seal it. Once it's sealed, it won't be opened until it comes back to Earth. So this is the picture. Oh dear, we've got an empty tube. What's happened? And then we kind of, there was a bit of panic actually. Had the core been flung out? And it turns out that the rock was very, very weak and just pulverized. It just collapsed and we didn't get a core basically. So that was a bit of a disaster, our first attempt. But we did get, once we, because we sealed this, because we actually got a sample of the Martian atmosphere. This is great because we'll be able to analyze the chemistry of the Martian atmosphere when that tube comes back to Earth. So we have an atmosphere sample and we always plan to collect an atmosphere sample. So this is great. So then this is, you can't see my thing. So we then drove along what we can see the R2B ridge over here to try and find another spot to drill basically. And this time we chose, we wanted to find a hard looking rock. That was something that was uh, tough basically. So we found this rock ridge and you can see these rocks have nice sides. So they must be quite tough, tough and firm. And so we chose this rock, Rochette, because it had these firm sides to attempt us our second drill campaign. So here we are abrading the surface and here's our abrasion patch with very complex mineralogies in here. And we have again analyzed the chemistry of these. And we think actually that this is a volcanic rock. So we think that this might actually be a lava flow, which is very exciting. So the minerals are consistent with igneous rock composition. So we see some salt crystals in here too. And this is the Sherlock. So we see angular elongated crystals. So we didn't see rounded grains that might be typical of a sedimentary rock. And then we drill. This is the drill bit, picture on Mars with the stabilizers. There's the, um, and there's the drill core. So again, successful drilling, but do we have a sample? And there we go. We had a drill sample in the core. And then this is the sample tube that's now, etc., made of titanium. And there we go. We have a successful sample tube, sample in the sample tube inside the sample handling facility. This is the first rock we've sampled that's going to come back to Earth. And then we sealed it. There it is sealed with its special number and this will not be opened until it's back on Earth in 2031. Then we collected a second sample from the same rock because we're collecting paired samples. And this, we took a selfie, or Perseverance took a selfie in, and there's a very proud Perseverance sort of admiring the two drill holes on the surface of Mars that it's collected. <coughs> After that, we wanted to get into that other terrain very fast. And so we, we made this record driving attempt. So normally what we do is when we're driving, we take, uh, prior to a drive, we take a navigation camera stereo image and that produces a 3D terrain model of the landscape. That's good for about 30, 40 meters and the rover drivers can drive the rover very accurately within those 30 meters. <coughs> but 30 meters isn't very far. So the rover actually has what we call an autonav functionality, 
where during a drive without any help from Earth, it can actually bypass boulders and things because it's taking pictures as it goes. And if it sees a boulder, it sidesteps. So in this movie, what you're going to see is the rover driving 180 meters entirely by itself, taking pictures as it goes along. So yeah, we have a self-driving car on Mars. You can see the terrain is pretty benign, which is why we were able to do it. There is a, there is a sharp edge at the right hand side though, so you know, we give it limits as to how far sideways it can go and it goes into if it goes too far sideways um, it goes into check mode and stops basically okay then we've got into this terrain area that we call SATA we drove the previous image was us driving along this ridge over here the R2B ridge and then we turned sharply came off this edge and drove into SATA um, into this terrain and this is Perseverance taken from orbit and you can see it's nestled up against these sand dunes here and we analyzed these rocks over here in the last three months. And this is what the terrain looks like. This is a Mars Cam Z image and we spent a lot of time analyzing these rocks over here and it's beautiful rocks and in fact we're going to be I can't tell you some secrets about this because we've got a big press conference so I'm going to be in this room uh, tomorrow evening actually it will be live streamed so you can go to the NASA site and find the live stream at the same time five o'clock tomorrow afternoon um, and we're going to be talking about the latest results which I can't, I can't actually talk, tell you about because they're going to be revealed tomorrow in the press conference about what these rocks represent and, and all I can say is that it's, it's a little bit surprising we didn't expect that so these are rocks this is a helicopter view so we used the helicopter to scout out the terrain we nestled up then the rover against these rocks and we used our arm instruments to look at the chemistry and we drilled two cores here at this location called BRAC. And this is the abrasion patch, which we call DUOB at BRAC. And you can see it looks very different to the previous uh, sample, basically. A very, very different chemistry, actually. So we've been analyzing this rock in enormous detail with, and very, very different chemistries. So it has a very different composition and a very different origin to the other rocks. And we're puzzling over that at the moment. And we've sampled it. And so there is a successful sample of this rock in our drill core, and it's now in our sample handling facility. So we now have four rock samples in our sample handling facility. And we're now going to collect two more. And on Friday, probably, we're going to collect our fifth rock sample, uh, hopefully. Um, um, so it's pretty exciting. In fact, I'm on shift on Friday, so that's going to be exciting. So I'm going to be, I'm, I have a role as a what we call a long term planner, um, and I'm sort of responsible for the rover working from the scientific side, working with the engineers as to what happens that day. I'm on tactical, that means I'm planning that day. So um, I'm actually going to be working with the engineers on Friday which is a day probably we're going to be making a drill attempt at um, getting our fifth sample so it's going to be exciting so and then after we've collected the sample we're over here we're going to be driving we might collect a few more rock samples but we're going to be driving back to the Octavia e butt landing site and then we're going to hot foot it driving as fast as possible doing very little science to the front of the delta because we want to look at these rocks over here at the form of the base of the delta these are like really fine grained rocks and this is where we're likely to uh, our best hope for finding organics, basically, um, that we want to sample for evidence for life. And so we, these are the rocks we want to sample to bring back to Earth, to look in Earth laboratories for evidence for ancient Martian life. Then we're going to drive up. So that previous image, this over here is um, this location over here. And we're going to this just shows you one scenario of how we're going to drive up onto the delta to explore all the delta rocks. Then we're going to drive very fast on the edge of the delta. We're going to explore those marginal units, which we think contain carbonate signatures, so another habitable environment. And some people think that these were carbonates formed in an ancient lake at the time that the lake in Jezero was at its highest level. Then we're going to cross onto these 
rocks over here, which are the crater rim, these are the crater rim rocks, and then traverse out of the crater to start exploring those ancient outside Jezero rocks. Okay, so what about sample return? So that's, as I've mentioned, we want to bring these samples back to Earth. And um, what's going to happen is in 2027, there's going to be a mission that lands on Mars and sends out a little fetch rover. And this little fetch rover is, going, is actually being built in Britain. It's being built by Airbus and Stevenage. What's going to happen is that Perseverance is going to deposit the samples it collects from its storage, from its rucksack, it's going to leave them on the surface of Mars at a depot point. We're going to land near that depot point and send this little fetch rover to collect those samples, put them into the fetch rover and then take them back to this facility and it's going to launch these into Mars orbit. So here's, they've, they've just released a video, so go to the Perseverance website. Just yesterday, they released a video of some of the tests they're doing on Earth. I haven't got the main video here, so you should go to that. But this is a video of the lander being uh, being tested. So here it's been dropped to look at how it's going to land. It's actually going to land within a 40 meter radius. It's just amazing. And, uh, and then this is the launch vehicle. So I've shown you this. This thing over here, this is the launch vehicle. Um, and this is the launch vehicle that's going to send that sample into Mars orbit. There's a full video on the Perseverance slide, so please go and look at that because it's amazing of how they're testing this to make the sample return happen. This is going to launch uh, the samples into Mars orbit. And then in 2031, there's going to be a third mission that's going to collect those samples and bring them back to Earth. And so there it is, launched into Mars orbit. And so again, just showing you that first sample that we hope to see on Earth by 2031. And it's not scientists like me who are going to be looking at that. It's going to be you lot, the younger generation, um, who can have the ability, using all your different skills, be it in chemistry, physics, engineering, biology, um, geology, in terms of analyzing these rock samples that will unfold the secrets of not only Mars, was there life on Mars, what's the geological history of Mars, but actually that early history of Mars will tell us about the earliest history of Earth. And we don't have rocks on Earth that can easily tell us this. So we have two parts of that puzzle. So really exciting and lots to look forward to. And I'm just gonna leave you with this, our first picture of the Martian sunset. Isn't that beautiful? And one day, Maybe by the 2050s, there'll be human astronauts, geologists and engineers and scientists. I don't want colonies on Mars. I don't believe in colonies and people living on Mars, but scientists going to Mars and they will witness something like this. There's just something amazing about seeing a sunset on Earth and to see that on Mars will be very spectacular. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanji. That was really fascinating, and I love that rovers can take selfies. <laughs> um, we've had lots of questions coming in, so lots of interest in, in your presentation. And I know that you said you could stay a little bit later yes. as well if we need to, to answer as many as we possibly can. Um, so I'm just going to kick off with the first question. Um, why has Mars changed so much? Ah, that's the big mystery. That's what we're trying to solve, actually. So that's a really good question that I can't answer. So essentially, um, Mars is a very thin atmosphere at the moment, but people think that earlier in its history, it had a, a thick atmosphere that allowed an uh, early um, hydrologic cycle, a water cycle, basically. So it rained on Mars, it had snow on Mars, and there were, you know, there was water in the atmosphere. So something changed and we, people think that Mars lo lost, had early on had a magnetic field and it lost its magnetic field because the core cooled. And so then the atmosphere was easily stripped by the solar wind basically. So remember that Mars is much smaller than Earth. It's about a third the size of Earth. And so that's what th people think happened, but that's a hypothesis. And what we want to do is to prove it. So by going to look at the rocks on Mars of that age, what we can do is the minerals 
that were formed under aqueous conditions, under watery conditions, they actually trap little gas bubbles inside them. So you can actually measure the composition of the Martian atmosphere and those gas bubbles, but also you have clay minerals which trap water and the chemistry of those water molecules has changed through time basically because we have different water isotopes. And so we can track the atmosphere chemistry through time on Mars. And so looking at those ancient rocks, particularly when we have them in Earth laboratories, we'll be able to see how that's changed and try and answer that question. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. So there's still lots of questions to, to be answered then by our young scientists coming through. Um, I'm going to move on now to a question about the rover itself. So how does the rover search for signs of past life? I know you've covered some of that in the presentation, but also quite importantly is, is why? Why is it important that we find signs of life? OK, so I think the why question is, it's actually not even a scientific question. It's really a philosophical question. Are we alone in the universe? Or did life arise elsewhere? You know, I, as a scientist, I find it incredible that life only arose on Earth. But was it just by chance? Is it a set of events on Earth that make Earth really special? And firstly, we're just curious. We'd like to know. But I think given you know the whole environmental uh, you know, conditions on Earth and what we're seeing in terms of environmental catastrophe. I think it's really important for us to think about our place in not only the solar system and in the universe. And so Mars is really the, the one of the key places to look for life. And I think it would be really momentous if we discovered evidence for microbial life, because maybe life on Earth and Mars was seeded from elsewhere, and there might be flourishing, you know, life forms elsewhere. In the solar in the solar system in in, in the universe essentially, um, and how do we look? We're looking for chemical signatures, but what we will do is we can look for organics with some of our instruments. But really, the action will really start once we bring those samples to Earth and we can analyze them in Earth laboratories. Thank you. So, how is the rover powered, and how long does its power last? So we have a plutonium battery, so it's a nuclear reaction basically, so it will last a long time. Earlier rovers were powered by solar panels, which is problematic. Um, so we will last a long time. I, I would imagine, you know, Curiosity has been going since 2012, so almost um, 10 years. And, um, uh, you know, we expect Perseverance to last 10, 15 years. And so is that when Rover will stop its mission in about we'll 10 years? Carry, we'll carry on as long as okay. the ro it's, Rover doesn't break and we don't run out of funding, basically. <laughs> OK. What, what do you think about the potential for humans to colonise Mars? I know that you said that you didn't really want them to, but um, do you think it will be possible? Um, I think it would be really hard. So I think I think astronauts will go to Mars because it's really the only place we can go to in the solar system. So I think that's possible. It's all about astronaut safety at the moment. It's about safety because landing is very difficult, etc. Will we colonize Mars? I don't know why we would want to colonize Mars. Um, I think we would go there for scientific exploration. So we might send astronauts tens, maybe a hundred to live um, like going to Antarctica, but we don't colonize Antarctica. We wouldn't ever think of colonizing Antarctica, so I don't really understand this. And it's quite important to think about the consequences of colonizing Mars. Um, you know, I took part in a debate recently, and my argument was that um, we don't know if there's life on Mars, present day life on Mars, and I think it's important to maybe let that life evolve without human intervention. But you think then that scientists will eventually be able to go to Mars? Yeah, I think it'll happen by the 2040s, 2050s. It's very difficult to do science with a robot. I think humans will make it much easier. If there was water on Mars, where did it go? So I think once Mars lost, it, lost its atmosphere, it would have become extremely cold because it wouldn't have been the greenhouse effect. So either part of the water would have um, evaporated 
to the atmosphere, but a lot would have got locked in the subsurface as ice, what we call ground ice. So there's probably a lot of ice in the Martian subsurface. So that's where the water went. <coughs> And how do you intend to bring the samples back to Earth, the samples that you're taking on Mars? Well, I showed that a little bit. So we'll have this lander that will collect the samples that the rover leaves on the surface of Mars. These will be launched into Mars orbit and there'll be a third mission that basically captures the capsule. So just imagine a little capsule containing the samples that's orbiting Mars for a couple of years and that will capture those and bring them back to Earth. And the reason we have three separate missions is that because they're so expensive to build, you don't want to build them before we know that we're, each part of the mission is successful. And how do you prevent those samples from being contaminated? So they're sealed in these very, very special titanium tubes. So as best as possible, they, they're very durable and away from the Martian environment. Okay. So I've got another question about uh, life on Mars. So do you think there's a higher probability of life being on Mars or perhaps on other planets or moons such as Saturn and Jupiter? We don't really know. I think there are, I mean, the moon of um, Saturn, Titan, actually has, it's the only other place apart from Earth which has liquids on its surface, but those liquids are liquid hydrocarbons so methane and ethane. Maybe there's life forms in there, we don't know. And then some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn actually have subsurface oceans. So um, um, there's one plan to actually, have, you have these geysers that are spouting off some of that water or the liquid. And so there's a plan to sample some of those things and look at the chemistry. So there may be life in those, but it's gonna be, um, a very different form. We just don't know. You know, we, we, we simply don't know what we might expect, basically. And if you were to find life on Mars or anywhere else, how do you think the scientific community would react to that? I'd imagine they'd be pretty excited. I think it's not just the scientific community. It would be, yeah, um, yeah the whole, uh, you, can you imagine the announcement? It, it would just be extraordinary. I think it'd be, it, it would be one of the most extraordinary moments in, of humanity to, to be able to discover something like that. <clears throat> and how do we know that different forms of life uh, need the specific conditions that humans and, and life on Earth need? Um, we don't know that, but we use Earth as a guidance, basically. That's all we have. So, you know, we need uh, these different signatures, the chemical ingredients of life. We need energy and we need water. And so that's what we're using. We, there, there are signposts for life. And that's the, what we do in the first instance. But you know, we don't know. So some people have suggested that some of these older rocks might have subsurface life without abundant water. And so, so we just don't know. We just have to search. You know, part of science is just searching and we might have serendipity. <clears throat> And if you were to find life on Mars, do you think there's a possibility it could have come from Earth? Yeah, so there's several ideas. You know, when you have meteorite impacts, bits of rock get flung to another planet. So actually we have bits of Mars on Earth. We have Martian meteorites. They have a very different chemical signature. So what happened was that there was an impact on Mars. It flung off some rock that landed on Earth. So those sorts of events might have transferred life. We don't know. So moving on to Ingenuity, the helicopter, um, how, how is it getting on? It's doing really well. So it was a technology demonstrator and they decided to extend the mission and use it for science. So what it does is it does scouting for us of the terrain that we can't see and helps us drive and select geological locations. So it's fantastic. It's going really well. And as I said, we've got our, I think our 18th flight planned for later in the week. <coughs> And how would the differences in Earth's and Mars gravity impact on the health and body of people, say the scientists that we were able uh, that were able to go on to Mars for extended periods of time? So that's a really good question. Um, not my expertise, but doctors, medics are really researching that. Um, so I think 
things are bone growth would be slower. They're worried about bone waste. There's a lot of health issues. And that's why we actually haven't sent humans to Mars yet, is that we have to consider that you know, we don't want astronauts to die. It would be terrible. So I think we need to understand the medical risks and be able to alleviate those. Uh, the biggest risk is radiation. So actually, Curiosity has an instrument that detects radiation. And in fact, when, right at the beginning of my talk, I said that Curiosity was nuzzled up against a cliff face. We're actually doing a radiation experiment. We want to see how the rover being next to a cliff face, being shielded from radiation, is going to reduce the radiation budget because that's where you might want to live. You might want to build a habitation next to a big cliff face. And so we're doing all these experiments to test and then prepare for humans to go to Mars. But we need to do this prior work. What about the health of the rover itself? Has it experienced any damage since it's been on Mars? So Perseverance, no, we're doing really well. Curiosity, obviously it's an old rover, but we've surmounted those. It's amazing. So actually the drill mechanism on Curiosity failed. And the engineers, you know, it's not that you can send an engineer. It's not like you can send a gas boiler engineer to mix your, mix, fix your boiler. The engineers devised a completely new way of drilling. And they did this and then they just sent some commands computer commands to the rover to do this. And we've actually now drilled more holes on Mar on, in Gale Crater with the new system of drilling than with the old system. So it, it, it's amazing. And then we have errors with our computers. So we have two computers, an A and a B site. One is a backup. And you know we did this, you know, there, was a, there was a big solar storm. And I think one of the computers got damaged by the radiation actually. And we switched from the A side to the B side. And that was, you know, really stressful because we're basically changing the brains of the, you know, computer of the rover, basically. So again, we surmounted that and we've now made one of those a, B, a, a backup. And I've gone back to the A side, so it's amazing what we can do. Yeah, there's a question around that, actually. So what happens if NASA loses connection with the probe completely? I think that's very unlikely. We have many different ways of communicating. So I, I don't think that's a problem. There's, 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 there, you know, we can directly uplink to the rover. We can do it through satellites. Um, obviously, that would be pretty disastrous, but we have many ways of doing this. And so I think I don't I think that's the least of our worries, actually. <clears throat> and once the, the mission is finished or once the rover finishes the mission, um, how will you dispose of it from Mars? We don't dispose of it, it stays there. It becomes space archaeology. So you know what, who knows? Obviously, because there's no water on the surface of Mars, it doesn't, you know, disappear. Um, and so, you know, you might have tourists visiting Mars looking at ancient, <laughs> uh, uh, ancient ruins of um, early human, you know, early human activity on Mars. Yep, that would be some holiday. <laughs> Um, with the amount of evidence so far, how many animals do you think have lived on Mars? Zero evidence. Okay. <laughs> no, we have no evidence for life on Mars. We have discovered organic compounds. Curiosity discovered organic compounds. But um, um, those are, I think, are abiotic, so they were formed not due to biological processes. So, but it's amazing that we can detect organics in rocks that are three and a half billion years old. And if humans lived on Mars, so as well as um, perhaps leaving debris on Mars, um, do you think we would cause climate change on Mars like we've done on Earth? Well, the climate change has already ha kind of happened, so I think it'd be quite difficult. Um, and you'd need billions of people. So I think I think the greater worry is that um, it'll be quite difficult for us to tell whether we've actually discovered life on Mars or not, because we might not have searched enough. And so I think our biggest worry is actually we might do, we might bring life to Mars 
We won't bring humans, but we might bring microbial life from Earth to Mars, and it might propagate. So in our search for life on Mars, we might actually only discover life from Earth, and that's a bit of a disaster. So that's where we have to be careful. Well, that was one of the questions, in, questions as well, was can viruses and bacteria survive on Mars? And from what you said, you think so, it could. That's actually why we go to very arid places. So there's actually areas we're not allowed to go to. So that's actually an international commission that decides where rovers and spacecraft can go. We can't go to places with any evidence for possible liquid water or ice, because obviously when a spacecraft lands, it melts the ice. And if there were bacteria on the rover, they can't be completely clean. Um, that might allow the bacteria to propagate and to be dispersed. So we can only go to these dry, arid places on Mars. So we've talked a little bit about sending humans to land on Mars, but how, what's the benefit? So how much more data do you think you could gather by having human scientists on, on Mars? So humans have sort of a brain. We have cognitive abilities. We can make decisions. So I think generally what we do on Mars in maybe a week, I could do in 30 minutes. It's just much faster. We can make decisions. We can get to places that the rover can't go. So that whole CETA terrain was very difficult to drive in. As a human, astronauts could walk all over it and quickly collect samples and map it. You know, over here, I'm going to show you this map over here is actually an original of the first geological map ever made. It's actually the geological map of Britain. It's the William Smith map made by William Smith of um, England. It's internationally famous. And we're making the first, you know, the geologists that will go to Mars will make the first maps of the surface of Mars, and that map will be something equivalent to this. It will be historically as important. Um, but it's very difficult for a robot to do that, and that's why I think we will send humans there. And if we moved on to Mars, how would we survive with a lack of water? So we would actually have to make water. And so one way to make water would be to extract it from these hydrated minerals like clay minerals. So you would have to use some sort of industrial process to extract that. Um, there is water in the Martian atmosphere, a very thin amount or in sand. In sand dunes, there's water adhering to the sand grains. So you'd have to extract that, but it's not easy. And again, people are kind of trying to come up with techniques to do that. And do you think the information that we get from our missions on Mars, will that help inform us to stop our own climate change, do you think? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I think the space, so remember, NASA is a, a NASA and ESA as space agencies. So you obviously we have, we've got a, a European mission going in two years time, the Rosalind Franklin rover. Again, the rover is, has been built in Britain. Um, those are space missions, but the space agencies also send missions that send satellites that monitor the health of the Earth. So they have all these missions that are measuring the soils, the water content, etc. So, you know, sometimes engineers that work on space missions also work on those missions. And I think importantly, just looking at this barren planet helps us think about our wonderful green, blue planet full of plants and water and atmosphere, air. And so I think it makes us feel special, actually. So I think for me, Working on a space mission has actually made me think more, more about our own planet. Okay. And if people say that Mars is like Earth, does that mean Mars has a core, an outer core, mantle and crust? Yes, but it doesn't have plate tectonics. So actually we only have these results very recently. So there's a mission that landed on Mars um, um, in uh, 2018, I believe, InSight. That was a geophysics, a physics mission, and that was out there to measure uh, Mars quakes, like earthquakes, and it had a seismometer on it. Actually, one of the instruments was built at Imperial College, um, and they've actually detected Earth Mars quakes 
And because those, those waves, Mars quakes, um, the seismic waves travel through the Martian uh, interior, they've actually, there was a set of papers that came out earlier this year that showed the first evidence for the internal structure of Mars. And I can't remember the details, but um, you know, it's spectacular that we're learning so much. OK, just coming up to the final couple of questions now. Um, how long did it take to build the Perseverance rover? Oh, gosh, probably about eight years, something like that. I don't know. I wasn't involved in those early stages, actually. So, yeah, quite a long time to design it, etc. And by 2040, how many rovers do you think will be on Mars? Oh, I've no idea. Maybe other countries will send rovers. Obviously, China sent a very successful rover. Um, you know, other countries have designed to send rovers, India, for example. So who knows? Maybe uh, let's, let's hope not too many. Well, thank you very much, Sanjeev. That was a fantastic lecture. And we've got lots of interest with all the questions. And thank you so much for staying a little bit longer to answer as many of them as we possibly can. So some of my colleagues are going to post in the chat other ways to keep in touch with us and find out what programs our outreach team are running. So do have a look uh, at the extra activities that, that we're doing for you. And I guess that means that tonight's session sadly has come to an end, but remember that we do have the recording. So please do watch again and share with your friends and I saw says or I have to say now is good night and thank you so much for coming to our lecture this evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining. Bye. Thank you.